Within the context of questions about who should work and how they should work, government policymakers turned to the issue of how to deal with the difficulties imposed by the Depression. Unemployment meant that many people were losing their homes, being evicted from housing, and having to scavenge for food. Farmers abandoned land to bankers who held mortgages. Mothers and their children lived from hand to mouth, searching for food and sustenance where they could. The early relief programs of the 1930s were generally run by local municipalities and states and by the charities that were completely overwhelmed. But very soon, the federal government began to step in. The National Industrial Recovery Act, signed into law in 1933, allowed industrialists to band together to divide up and rationalize the production of goods. The act provided for codes developed by industrial groups, but its infamous Section 7A also demanded that each group include representatives of workers. Together, these groups would determine a minimum wage for a particular job down to the last detail of how much should be paid for a particular task that took a measured amount of time. NIRA codes also established rules for how workers might be treated on the job. Let's pass over for the moment the fact that without apology, the code set prices that differed for men and women and that ensured that women's jobs paid less than those done by men. Instead, we note that the establishment of committees required workers to choose representatives. In the eyes of many people, that opened the door to unionization. The president wants you to join a union became a powerful new organizing weapon. The Supreme Court declared NRA codes and the National Industrial Recovery Act unconstitutional about a year after they had been passed by Congress. A parallel act, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which tried to make some of the same arrangements for rural areas, was also declared unconstitutional. But the union campaign continued, ultimately organizing millions of unhappy working people under the banner of the American Federation of Labor, and then under its more inclusionary offspring, the Congress of Industrial Organizations. Women as well as men flooded into these unions, often into segregated female locals and protected by new legislation that gave workers the right to organize. Within less than seven years, union membership climbed from fewer than three million to more than nine million workers. And industrial unionism meant that women and African Americans could organize as well. Because the federal government imagined men and women serving different labor market functions, it continued to treat men and women differently in the relief programs it set up by establishing programs to put young people to work on environmental projects. The Civilian Conservation Corps sent urban, mostly young men, out into rural areas to preserve them and to make them more accessible to wider publics. The camps set up by the Civilian Conservation Corps generally excluded women, and it was only later, under the pressure of women advocates, most notably Hilda Smith, that a few women's camps opened. Here's a photograph of Eleanor Roosevelt visiting one of what became known as the she, 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 instead of C, C, C camps. This one is for unemployed women in upstate New York.